Well, this morning we're going to begin a study of a section of Matthew, Matthew 24 and 25, that is commonly known as the Olivet Discourse. Um, in this section, Jesus is speaking about his return and his second coming. And the setting, of course, is the Mount of Olives. So that's why it's called the Olivet Discourse. This is the Lord's own sermon on his second coming. And so let's look at uh, chapter 24, Matthew 24, if your Bibles are open, verses 1 through 28. It says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat at the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will be offended, and will betray one another, will hate one another. Many prophets will rise up, false prophets will rise up and deceive men. And because of lawlessness abounding, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, Matthew adds, whoever reads, let him understand. Then those things who are in, in those, the, the, I'm sorry, then who, those who are in Judah shall flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those that are pregnant and those that are nursing during these days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will come tribulation, a great tribulation such as never has been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is here in the desert, or do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Our Father, we ask you to, this morning to open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have to say to us from your word. And I pray, Lord, that you give me grace to speak your word according to what you'd have me say. And Lord, that those here and those listening on the internet might get a blessing from this message, be challenged, and be equipped as we go into what I believe are the last days on earth. And I pray that we would be equipped and we would be discerning and that we would be ready. And I ask Lord that if there's any listening this morning that, that don't know you as Savior and Lord, that this would be the day you'd open their hearts and they would receive your word and receive your invitation and understand that yes, I'm a sinner but Jesus Christ came and bore my sins on the cross and died in my place so that I could be forgiven and have eternal life if I'll put my trust in him. And I pray that you give them grace to do just that. And now, Lord, speak through me to those that are listening and 
Let me communicate your truth and nothing but your truth. And I pray this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are on the Mount of Olives. And again, I say this is Jesus' own sermon about his second coming. It comes at a very appropriate time because from the human viewpoint, it looks as if his ministry, his first coming, has been a total disaster and a failure and a massive disappointment. Now, you'll recall, it's been a couple weeks because we had uh, Palm Sunday and then Easter Sunday, and so we've been out of Matthew for a couple of weeks, but uh, we said that Jesus came into Jerusalem in chapter 21 on what we call Palm Sunday. That was the beginning of what is sometimes called Passion Week, which we've just celebrated. And Sunday was his triumphal entry and then the cleansing of the temple. Now, we're not real certain about the, the timetable and the schedule here, but piecing it together as best as I could, I would figure that chapters uh, 21 and, and the, the cleansing of the temple and then into chapter 22 and 23, uh, and, and really beginning with verses 18 and 19 of chapter 21, took place on Monday. It says, chapter 21 and verse 18, in the morning he returned to the city and he was hungry. That's when he saw the fig tree. So that was, would have been Monday morning. Now, he spent the entire day apparently teaching in the temple region. Uh, in chapter 22, he was confronted by uh, first the Herodians, and then the Sadducees, and then the, the uh, scribes and, and the Pharisees that came, and asking them their questions, and he silenced all of them. Then, in chapter 23, he pronounced the woes to the Pharisees, uh, and that it follows logically that he just finished with those three groups, and now he goes away with his disciples, and I remember I told you that he was speaking to his disciples, but in their hearing. They were there, and so they were, I think, intentionally speaking to them. They were overhearing everything he was saying to his disciples. And that takes us up now through uh, chapter 23, and then he laments over Jerusalem in verses 37 and 38 and 39. He weeps over Jerusalem. The Bible tells us that uh, now it's, He's on the Mount of Olives, and he's walking out of the city and having this conversation with his disciples in the beginning of uh, chapter 24 here in verses 1 and 2 and 3. And uh, we're told in chapter 26 and verse 1 that as he's talking to the disciples, that he says, now, you know that in two days is the Passover. So Passover would have been Wednesday. So apparently this is still... Monday or perhaps Tuesday morning, uh, Luke tells us that he taught in Jerusalem during the day and at night he went back to the Mount of Olives. So this may be uh, Monday night now that he's back on the Mount of Olives speaking to his disciples. We see in uh, chapters uh, 26 verses 6 through 16, a little parenthetical section where he's uh, telling about what happened with Judas. And then in verse 17, he says, now the first day of the feast of the leaven, unleavened bread had come, and that would have been Wednesday, if my calculations are correct. So Wednesday at sundown was the beginning of Passover. Thursday was the crucifixion. Sunday, the resurrection. And shall we say, the world has not seen the last of Jesus at this point. So now he's with his disciples. And they're departing from the temple after he's had all of these conversations and confrontations with the Pharisees and Sadducees. He has just pronounced judgment on the Jews' house in chapter 23 and verse 38. He says, your house is left to you desolate. And they're coming out and crossing what is called the Kidron Valley, out, which is at the base of the Temple Mount, and to the east is... Uh, the Mount of Olives, and that's on the way to Bethany. And, and we know that he spent a lot of time in Bethany and probably was spending his nights there because he had friends that lived in town. Uh, that's where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. And so he's pronounced these judgments. And in verse 2, 
And, and, it, and it says that the disciples came with him and, and were pointing out to him, showing him all the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And it's almost like he's saying this with a tone of sadness, like all of this is just going to come down. It's just, it's beautiful, but it's going to, yeah, it's going to get burned. It's, it's all going to go down. And those words were literally fulfilled in 70 AD on the 29th of August when General Titus Vespasian uh, burned the temple. And uh, Josephus tells us that 6,000 people were killed in that fire. Tens of thousands were massacred in the city. Now, the construction of the temple began in 20 BC under Herod the Great, and it took the better part of 50 years to build the temple. There were stones that had been quarried out that were 12 foot by 12 foot by 40 foot long, um, white marble covered over with gold. It was a magnificent sight. And um, Titus built scaffolding around the walls of the temple and set it on fire and, and literally melted the stones. And, and uh, as they crumbled, it, it, they came in and retrieved all the melted gold and plowed the rubble off the mount into the Kidron Valley. And uh, it was about a 20 minute walk from the temple site to the Mount of Olives now across the Kidron Valley. And so that's where they are. But the, the Mount of Olives would have offered a very beautiful panoramic view of the temple, stunning view. And remember the disciples were young and, and you know, they had been to Jerusalem with Jesus a couple times, but this may, may have been the first time that they ever sat and really took a good look at the temple and, and like kids in the big city for the first time. And they're, they're just amazed at the view. And Jesus says, it's all going to come down. And of course, the Mount of Olives is across, uh, as I say, across the Kidron Valley and uh, right at the base is the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, which Gethsemane means olive press. And so it's at the base of the Mount of Olives. And uh, uh, the Mount of Olives, of course, is believed to be the place where Jesus ascended. And it's we're told in Zechariah 14, it's where he will return to earth and set foot on earth again. So in verse three now, the disciples ask this question and they say, well, okay, what's going to be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now, the word coming here is uh, not really what we would translate coming. The word is in the Greek language is parousia, which really means presence or arrival. Um, now, remember, the disciples aren't thinking that he's going to die. He's told them, but it hasn't sunk in. They must have wondered when the temple was going to be destroyed because they're expecting him to come in and take his throne and restore Israel. And, and now he says the temple is going to be destroyed. And, and so they're confused. And so, of course, they had associated Messiah with the coming of the end of the age. And his coming would mean judgment on the ungodly and salvation for Israel. And the kingdom would be restored and uh, the world would, uh, the whole world would uh, come and submit to the Messiah's rule, age of man's rule, and oppression of the people of God would be over. God would be exalted. It was going to be the golden age. And now he's saying the temple's going to come down. So they're saying, Lord, when is this going to, what's going to be the sign of your coming? And not so much the sign of your coming, but your, you know, revealing yourself to the world and, and coming into your own, taking your throne, as it were. And they were asking for a sign that would tell them what it was going to be. Uh, what sign is going to be uh, the sign of your coming, your inauguration of all your um, our messianic expectations? And it's kind of like, you know, when they were with him after the crucifixion in Acts chapter 1 and, and verse 6. And, you know, the, the crucifixion had to just be a real hiccup to them. I mean, I don't mean that irreverently, but they weren't expecting that. And then, of course, they weren't expecting the resurrection. And, and so they'd been through all of that. Jesus had been with them now, and, and he's walking up to the Mount of and they're saying, Lord, now will you restore the kingdom? Uh, now, at, at this time, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And look what Jesus says in verse 7. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. 
but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And it's like he's saying to them, quit worrying about when I'm going to come back. Just go out and be witnesses. Do the job that I've told you to do and quit arguing and speculating and wondering and asking, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? Just do what I told you. They could have never imagined that it would be 2,000 years. But like them, even today, there are many, many who confuse, first of all, his first coming and his second coming. And they're always speculating and always wondering, when is he coming back? And you might have expected we're going to be in Matthew 24 and 25 today. We have a big chart back here with a line and showing you here's the rapture and the tribulation and all these things. And, and we're not, that's not going to be our purpose this morning. That's not our reason for being here this morning. I want to take you through and show you what Jesus had to say in this message and, uh, of course, comment on it. The temple was going to be destroyed. Jerusalem was going to be under Gentile control. And by the way, Luke, 24, Luke 21 and verse 24 says, they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And uh, Luke says, and, and Jesus says in Luke, Jerusalem will be tra trampled underfoot of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And the time of the Gentiles we've been talking about on Sunday nights began with the fall of uh, Jerusalem in, in 586 B.C. So now, here we are. And as I say, it's not our purpose this morning to give you a big eschatological lecture. That's a big word that means end times. Or to figure out when the rapture is going to come. And clearly, <laughs> Jesus has told us politely in, in Acts 1.17, look, that's none of your business. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. He's told us we're to be about making disciples. Disciples. So... I want to share two things with you this morning from this message that Jesus preached. Number one, we are to be discerning. We are to be careful. Let me point to a couple of verses. Verse number four, take heed that no one deceives you. Verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand Verse 23, 24, 25, 26. If anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, don't believe it. False Christ, false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders and deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Look, he's in the inner rooms. Don't believe it. The first thing he says in response to their question is, guys, Let's just cool it a little bit here. Be careful. Be discerning. And the second thing he says is, we must be ready. We must be prepared. Prepare, as Amos said in Amos 4 and verse 12, prepare to meet your God. And so this morning, it's going to be our purpose to look at those two things. Number one, he said, be discerning. Verses 4 through 13. So now Jesus tells them, you know, don't get all wound up about when I'm coming again. Don't get in such a big hurry. And I know many, many people that read this passage and they say, earthquakes, there's been a lot of earthquakes. Pestilence, oh, we're in the coronavirus. Famine, there's a famine in Ethiopia, in Africa. There's famine. It must be time. It must be time is here. And they'll point to verse number eight that says, these are the beginning of sorrows. And the word sorrows there literally uh, well, we translate it birth pangs, uh, as in, you know, contractions. And so there's this way of looking at it. And, and I think it makes good sense that, uh, you know, as a woman is about to give birth to a child, she has birth pangs or contractions, and they become closer and closer and closer together until it's time for the baby to be delivered. And so people say, well, there's a greater frequency and a greater intensity of these things and that may or may not be true, but they say this is surely a sign that the end is about to come. Verse 6, he says, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Wars and rumors of wars. That proves it. And look what he says next. Don't be troubled. The end is not yet. 
The end is not yet. Hmm. Oh. Verse 8. This is just the beginning. The beginning of Udenon. Odenon, sorrows, birth pangs. Now he talks about the destruction of the temple and their question that they ask in response to that. And, and as in a lot of prof prophecy, we'll see this in, in the text here, there's a primary meaning to his answer. And so there's a lot of confusion even as to what he's talking about here. Is he talking about strictly about what happened in AD 70 or is there a further future interpretation and fulfillment of this? I believe that yes, there is. There are people who are called amillennial that don't believe really in uh, a literal second coming millennial kingdom. And, and they believe that we're in that already. And, and I can't for the life of me see how they reconcile any number of scriptures with that position. But they, that's their position that they hold. And a lot of historic Baptists held that position. Uh, I think the biggest obstacle to believing that way is the presence of the nation of Israel in our world today. But uh, prior to 1948, there were a lot of people that believed that way. And there still are some, but that's one view. And then there's a dispensational view, which we've talked a lot about. And I'm 99% probably dispensational, although I don't... Uh, read my Schofield Bible from the bottom up, as some say. But bottom line is that I believe that, yes, there is yet a, a future fulfillment of these things. And, and you'll hear me say that, and it'll come through, I think, loud and clear in, in our, our messages here over the next couple of weeks. What does all that mean? That the destruction of the temple was a foreshadowing, a prophetic type or foreshadowing of what we're going to see. We see it also down here in verse 15 when he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Well, what is this abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel? It's in Daniel chapter 11, verse 31 and chapter 12 and verse 11. The initial fulfillment of that, most people believe, was in 168 B.C., when this character by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes desecrated the temple. What he did, he came in, he, he erected a statue of Zeus in the middle of the Jews' temple, an idol. And then to worship his statue of Zeus, the Greek god Zeus, he sacrificed a pig and poured its blood out on the holy altar in, in the temple in Jerusalem, desecrating it completely. And so... Antiochus Epiphanes, the abomination of desolation, or some Bibles say the abomination that makes desolate, is thought to be a type or a foreshadowing of the Antichrist who will be on earth and rule at the end of time in what's called the tribulation period. And so uh, there's a little bit of that foreshadowing here. Some of this uh, in the first couple of verses, I believe he's making a specific reference to the temple destruction. And now he's going to talk about the course of history in the last days. And oh, by the way, the Bible told us right after the departure of Jesus, after the ascension of Jesus, that, that these were the last days. So we've been in the last days for 2,000 years. I mean, are we at the last of the last days? Well, we're closer to the end than we were 2,000 years ago, obviously. But let's look at number uh, a couple of things here. Number one, some natural phenomena. The question is, what's going to be the sign of your coming? What's going to be the sign of your parousia, your, your presence, your, your uh, ascending, your, your revelation as Messiah? And I think Jesus just answers their question. And, and if you read this, verse 4, he says, look... <laughs> Uh, don't let anybody deceive you. Be careful that you don't get deceived. He says in verse 5, many are going to come in my name saying I'm the Christ, and, and they'll deceive many. And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Uh, see that you're not troubled by this. For all these things must come to pass, but the end has not yet come. Now, did he say any of those things were associated with the end? I don't think so. I think what he's saying is you're, 
a lot of things are going to happen between now and then. A lot of things are going to happen. There's going to be incidents, uh, continuous international incidents in verses 6 and 7. So many people have looked at this to prove that the Lord's return is near. And he says just the opposite in verse 8. No, no, this is just the beginning. Verse 6, all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. You know how many books have been written? I heard uh, Dr. Don Carson talking about this one time. He said, you know, he, he mentioned how many books he had in his library that were written between 1939 and 1945 that were establishing the fact, the fact that Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist and Mussolini was the false prophet or the beast out of the sea or whatever. And Adolf Hitler and Mussolini and Mao and Stalin and Henry Kissinger and in recent years of Barack Obama have all been, is this the Antichrist? There's all sorts of speculation. Then there were natural disasters. Again, verse 7 and 8, you know, earthquakes, famines, pestilences. In various places. Again, this is just the beginning of sorrows. And I hear people say, there's been more earthquakes in the last hundred years than ever in all time before that. Well, we don't know that. We don't know how many earthquakes there were in, you know, David's time or Moses's time or anything. And whether they happened on the other side of the world that nobody knew about. But there's all sorts of disastrous events going on. Uh, the coronavirus is a pestilence. Is this a sign of the end times? I don't know. It may be. I'll tell you what. The response to, to it by the government, I think, is a good dress rehearsal for us. We better be prepared for what's coming because it's getting ugly. Famine. By the way, there's, I think, less famines now than there ever has been any time in history because we've got better ways of producing food. But... The point is, he says, it's not yet time. And I think what he's saying here is, look, there's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be famines. There's going to be pestilence. There's going to be natural disasters. There's going to be conflicts. Don't assume that everything that happens is the end of the world. It's like, it's not the end of the world. Literally, it's, it's not. It's not time yet. When it's time, it'll be time. All kinds of disasters. He says, nations rising against nations. That doesn't happen in a day. Usually, I guess it can. But, you know, clearly he's saying to these guys, look, it's going to be a while. You better strap it on and, and uh, hunker down because you're going to be, you know, it's not going to be like next week or anything. Okay? Don't get too wrapped up in it. Again, Acts chapter 1-7. It's not for you to know the times. You be witnesses. You make disciples. Now, don't curb your enthusiasm for his return. I mean, I've loved to be around people. Uh, a good friend of ours just passed away here recently who was always uh, walking around every time he'd say, how are you doing? He'd say, well, perhaps today's the day. And I'd say, well, maybe, but I think there's at least seven years that have to come first, but whatever. But at any rate, people who are enthusiastic for the Lord's we're, we're told to keep looking up. In fact, in chapter 25 and verse 13, he says, uh, Watch, therefore, for you don't know the day nor the hour that the Son of Man is coming. Luke chapter 12 and 37, he says, Blessed are those servants whom the Master, when he comes, will find them watching. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8 says, Finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing, his parousia. Isn't that a wonderful promise? So don't get wrapped up in it, but don't let it curb your enthusiasm either. I mean, especially if it's going to motivate you to go out and win souls as we're commanded to do. That's a wonderful motivation. We ought to live expecting that the Lord is going to return soon. But there's a number of natural phenomena. Then let me deal with some spiritual phenomena here. Here's where the warning to be discerning, I think, becomes especially relevant. He talks about conflicts. Conflicts back in chapter 10 and verse 34 through 37. He says, you know, mother will be divided against daughter and husband against wife and, you know, mother against son. And, you know, 
I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. There's going to be conflicts in the family. And now here in 6 and 7, he talks about between nations, wars and rumors of wars. Don't be troubled by these things. He says, they must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 9, there'll be persecution. He says, they'll deliver you up to tribulation to kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then, by the way, he says, then. That doesn't mean next in order sequentially. It just means then, at that time. They'll deliver you up and turn you over to the authorities. We're seeing that even now with this corona nonsense. Oh, there's a church over there that met. We're going to go take their license plates. We're going to put them on a quarantine for 14 days. Oh, I saw some people playing in the yard and talking. They were too close to each other. I'm going to call the police on them. What a bunch of busybodies. But that's what's going to be. Matthew 10 and 17 says, Beware of men, for they'll deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. We are so painfully parochial in the United States of America. We have such an entitled view of things. And people would say, well, surely the rapture is going to come first because God wouldn't put us through any kind of suffering. You want to bet? Tell that to the Christians in North Korea or Russia or Sudan. Saudi Arabia, or China, or Ethiopia. Listen, the history of the church is a history of persecution and opposition. We're not talking about Christian triumphalism here. We don't deserve the comforts that we enjoy. What is normal is for the church to be persecuted and opposed. It's happening more and more as we get around to it. Here's, a, you know, whether this is a sign of the birth pangs and the end of time. It's happening more and more as we think of the third world. In verse 10, it says, many will be offended because of you. That literally means cause to stumble and they'll betray one another. It says, number two, there'll be false prophets. Number one, there'll be persecution. Number two, false prophets in verse 11. Many false prophets will arise and deceive many. How will they deceive? Look at verses 23 through 26, a little further down. Verse 24, false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go. If he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. They will deceive through their signs and wonders. By the way, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9 says, the coming of the lawless one, that's the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Revelation 13 and verse 3 tells us that he performs great signs and wonders so that he even makes fire come down from heaven to the earth in the sight of men. Sounds down, downright Pentecostal, doesn't it? Fire falling from heaven. You know, and, and of course he'll claim, look, I'm just like operating in the power of Elijah, you know. Second Timothy 4 and verse 3 says, The time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers. And brethren, we live in a day when the word of God is no longer authoritative because somebody says, I had a word, I had a vision, I had a, I saw a miracle, I spoke in tongues, I did this or that, I got a word of knowledge. And never mind what the word of God says. It doesn't matter if it lines up with scripture. And we're based more on our experience than we are on the revealed truth of the word of God. That's a scary thing. I need to hurry along. Number one, he says, be discerning. But number two, he says, be ready. Verses 14 through 28. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. What do you mean by be ready? Well, let me tell you something. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, in verse 3, you won't even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. In verse 7, he said, ye must be born again. Verse 10, he says, many will stumble. That carries the idea of falling away. Now we know from our earlier teaching in, in uh, back in earlier in Matthew, 
Jesus talked about two, two ways, the broad way that leads to destruction and the narrow way that leads to life. And he says, many, broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there are who find it. He said, uh, in that day, many will come and say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? Many, many, many will be deceived. Verse 13 tells us, he who endures to the end will be saved. Well, who's going to endure to the end? Well, the elect, the saved. You don't like that word elect? Okay, those that are saved. Not the ones who make a decision. Not the, listen, not the ones that say, oh yeah, I don't want to go to hell. I, I want to escape into rapture. I don't want to go through any of this mess. I want to be out of here before that. So yeah, what's the prayer? Let me tell, tell me what prayer I need to say. People that, you know, say a prayer, walk an aisle. And I'm not saying that walking an aisle or saying a prayer precludes you from being saved, but I'm just saying, don't bet your salvation on such trivial things. Those who endure to the end. What does that mean? Not those who fall back. Hebrews 10 and verse 38. The just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition or destruction, but those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now, be careful here. This does not teach that we're saved because we persevere. No, 1 Peter 1.5 says that we are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We are not saved because we persevere. We persevere because we are genuinely saved. Perseverance is the fruit of our salvation. Scripture is full of promises that God keeps us and true believers will endure. Uh, 1 John 2 and verse 19 says, by the way, they went out from us because they were not of us. If they had been with of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest, that it might be made clear that none of them were of us. Verse 14, he says, the gospel must be preached to all the world. So it's not just that I need to worry about, am I prepared? Is my neighbor prepared? Are the people around me prepared? Is my family prepared? We need to preach the gospel to all the nations. So that they can be prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ and be ready when he comes again. So what's the sign? Verse 15. When you see the abomination of desolation, we talked about that, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then, then, time to head for the hills. I mean, very literally. He says, those who are in Judea, flee to the mountains. And by the way, he says in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3 and 4, let no one deceive you by any means. Signs and wonders, false teaching about the rapture. That day will not come. What day will not come? What day will not come? The abomination of desolation standing in the temple. Until or unless the falling away, the apostasy comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So that day, the day of the Lord, the return of the Lord will not come unless and until there's a falling away and apostasy and the man of sin is revealed who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and is worshiped, and he sits as God in the temple of God. There it is, showing himself to be God. And the Bible says in Revelation 13 and 14, he deceives those that dwell on the earth by those signs which he has granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lives. And he granted power to take breath of the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So he says, don't be deceived. That day is not going to come unless or until the falling away, the apostasy comes first and the man of sin is revealed, 
the son of uh, the son of perdition. That is the sign. And he says, when that happens, as I said, verse 17, or verse 16, head for the hills. Look at what a terrible time this is. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop not go down or take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those that are pregnant and those who are nursing babies during those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath day. <laughs> That's what happened in AD 70. That's what happened, by the way, in Europe in the 1930s. The Jews, when the Nazis came in, they were running from house to house on top of the houses, trying to get away and trying to escape. He says, don't take anything with you. Leave your clothes behind. Woe to the pregnant women. What? How'd you like to be running for your life from those that are seeking to kill you because of your faith while you're carrying a baby. Verse 20, pray that it's not in the winter or on the Sabbath day. By the way, by the way, what does it say that he urges them to pray that they don't have to flee for their lives on the Sabbath day? How important is the Lord's day to the Lord? How important is the Lord's house to the Lord? Oh, it's okay if we can't meet. We'll just do it by video. We'll just Zoom. We'll just live feed. Listen, live feed is not a substitute for assembling of ourselves together. I've been trying to be gracious about this, and I've said, if you can't come, stay home. If you don't feel good, stay home. If you're afraid, stay home, whatever. But I'll tell you what, we're not going to shut down. We're going to be here. I don't care if Pritzker likes it. But he says we better be ready in an instant. There's an urgency about this. You know, uh, uh, in, in, as a chaplain, sometimes I get called to go out in a, in a minute. And so I've learned to, to keep a, a, a go bag ready. I've got a, a, a small a rucksack that's not my rucksack, my uh, assault pack, as we call it. It's got, you know, my shaving kit in it and an extra uniform and stuff that I need in case I ever have to go. I can go up in my closet and grab that and I'm out, out the door. For a while there, I was keeping it in my trunk. But, you know, if you have a go bag, you might want to get one. <laughs> Luke 23 and verse 28, Jesus says, Daughters of Jerusalem, listen, with, this, with regard to this matter of the women that are pregnant, he says, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. This is when he's carrying the cross. He says, weep for yourselves, for your children. Indeed, the days are coming in which you'll say, blessed are the barren wombs that never bore and breasts which never nursed. And they'll begin to cry out to the mountains and say, fall on us for the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? Verse 21, then, then there will be the great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world, until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Never has been, nor shall be. Contrast that with verses 4 through 12, where he says, you know, every time there's a war, every time there's a rumor of war, every time there's a famine or a pestilence, it's going to happen. That's part of life. Don't get excited. He says, now, this is going to be a tribulation like has never been. And he says in verse 22, if those days weren't shortened, and that means limited, no flesh would be saved or survive. Now they will be, he says, for the elect's sake. But don't be fooled by false Christs and false messiahs and antichrists and false prophets. When Jesus comes, there'll be no mistaking it. He says in verse 27, as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, even so will the coming of the Son of Man be. It'll be that fast. The Bible says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed at the last trumpet. When Jesus comes, no one's going to miss it. Verse 28, wherever the carcass is, the eagles will gather together. I heard, uh, I read, I believe it was John MacArthur was saying that it's, it's like when there's a carcass on the ground and the Buzzards start to fly and circle above. They're miles up in the, in the sky, but they can see what's going on and they know what's going on and they're not fooled. They know what's down there. Light, lightning flashes across the sky. Everyone will see it. So what's the takeaway? Are you ready? 
Are you ready? Now, I said we weren't going to talk about when the rapture comes or when the tribulation starts or all those things. But I, I will say this, the two things Jesus said, be discerning and be ready. Be discerning and be ready. Are you saved? Are you ready? Because I'll tell you this, whether or not the rapture comes first or second or in the middle or at the end of the tribulation, is it going to be, is it going to get worse before it gets better? I mean, look, look what's going on right now with this corona mess. We had better be ready to endure. We had better be prepared to endure whatever may happen. I guarantee, regardless of when the rapture comes, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Then there will be tribulation like has never been on the earth. We had better be ready. We had better settle it right now. Look, if Pritzker can say you're not allowed to worship because there's a flu bug going around, what's going to happen when an Antichrist comes along and says, you're going to die if you don't worship me? By the way, today, this week, there's a county in Montana that mandated, are you ready for this? that unless you're wearing a government-issued armband, you will not be allowed to buy or sell. Now, thankfully, the conservatives in the, their legislature overruled that, and it didn't pass. But that was the law that was proposed. You can see it. It's on, it's on my Facebook page. You can see it, look it up and see it. So you better be ready. And oh, by the way, whether the rapture comes first or last or in the middle, any one of us could die in an instant. And we know that very well. In a room just behind me, my good friend Jason passed away one night at the age of 39 years old when he was supervising and chaperoning a youth event. And he went to sleep that night and in the morning he didn't wake up. 39 years old. Are you ready? Are you ready? You don't know when the Lord's going to come. And the Bible says, blessed are those who find, who he'll find waiting and watching when he comes. Our Father in heaven tonight, this morning, I pray that you would take this message and let it challenge and let it convict people and let it cause us Pause and wonder, am I ready? If Jesus were to come tonight, would I be ready? If my soul would be required of me this evening, this very night, would I be ready? And on the other hand, if the government continues in these oppressive, tyrannical tactics that they're trying out on us now, and it gets worse, and they were to hold a gun to my head or a knife to my throat and say, surrender and, and denounce Jesus or die, would I be prepared to face whatever persecution may come and pay whatever cost may come to be true to my Savior? Lord, I pray that we would examine our hearts this very morning, this very evening, this day, and examine ourselves and ask myself, am I ready? Am I prepared to meet my God? Father, I pray you would examine our hearts and, and search our hearts now as we respond to this challenge and this invitation. And give us grace to repent and follow you in obedience. And I pray these things for your glory in Jesus' name.